Frozen shoulders are recognized as one of the toughest conditions to treat. Weirdly enough, many healthcare practitioners preach that they will resolve on their own without intervention. Is this true? And if not, what can we do? Check out our online courses now. The link is in the video description. Hi and welcome back to PhysioTutors. This practice guideline was published to steer clinicians in the right direction for the management of adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulders. I would like to highlight a disclaimer though. The guidelines were published in 2013, which let's be honest is a while ago. New evidence emerged and I'll discuss a few of these papers throughout the video. Primary adhesive capsulitis affects 2-5% to of the population and secondary capsulitis due to thyroid disorders or diabetes has a prevalence of a whopping 4-38%, to which is insanely high. Make sure you're on full alert when a patient with shoulder pain steps into the clinic with comorbidities such as these. There are a few other risk factors. Patients with a history of Dupuytren's disease are also at an increased risk. If you'd like to know more about Dupuy trans disease, check out our guideline video in the upper right corner. In Japan, they call it the 50-year-old shoulder, which directly informs us of another risk factor. Rarely will you see a patient with a frozen shoulder younger than 40 years old or older than 65 years old. The peak incidence lies somewhere between 50 and 56 years. The guidelines say that females are more often affected than men. However, some authors call this into question. A history of a previous frozen shoulder should be considered as a risk factor too. There is a 5 to 34% chance that the pathology reoccurs contralaterally. Other risk factors include prolonged immobilization after surgery, a myocardial infarction, trauma, and autoimmune diseases. Frozen shoulders can start out of nowhere with a gradual stiffening and increase in pain over time. External rotation and abduction are primarily affected. The authors note that external rotation is most limited in neutral rather than in abduction. These restrictions are actively and passively present. The guidelines recognize four phases as a continuum. The early, freezing, frozen and thawing phases. Some authors leave out the early phase. Others suggest a predominantly painful phase and a predominantly stiff phase, to keep it simple. In the four phase model, the early phase is characterized by sharp pain with movements, achy pain at rest, and disturbed sleep. Oftentimes, this is where the diagnosis of a frozen shoulder is missed and healthcare practitioners label them as subacromial shoulder pain. Keep an eye out for the loss of external rotation as a hallmark sign of frozen shoulders. The second phase is characterized by a loss of motion in all planes and can last up to 9 months. Stage 3 is basically the same clinically and lasts up to month 15. The fourth and final one is a phase where pain decreases but stiffness can persist for up to 24 months. However, this does not mean that every patient will be symptom-free after two years. The average duration of a frozen shoulder is 30 months, with 50% of patients still having mild to moderate disability years after onset. As mentioned before, one of the pitfalls is misdiagnosis in the early stage. This phase is critical since a corticosteroid injection can alleviate a lot of pain and will, according to the most recent guidelines, not be administered with a wrongful diagnosis of subacromial shoulder pain. Let's make sure you won't miss the next one. There is a boatload of differential diagnoses to consider seen here. The patient's history and your clinical exam will be crucial here. The most common shoulder complaint is subacromial shoulder pain or rotator cuff related shoulder pain. These umbrella terms encompass some of the diagnoses in the previous list. As I noticed before, the guideline is a bit dated and new evidence emerged. The more recent rotator cuff related shoulder pain guideline considers tendonitis, bursitis, impingement, partial tears, and long head of bicep tendinopathies, all the same diagnosis. This makes the list at least a tad shorter. We have covered these guidelines as well, so if you're interested, click in the upper right corner. 
the general presentation is an increase in pain and stiffness over time and the inflammatory process will incur a lot of pain at night with sleep disturbances as a consequence. As stated before, the loss of range of motion is both active and passive. To put it in numbers, you need a 25% decrease in two planes of motion and a 50% decrease in passive external rotation compared to the uninvolved side. Having less than 30 degrees of external rotation will count toward the diagnosis as well. Special tests are not helpful for the diagnosis. The CPG provides a helpful flowchart for the diagnosis seen here. In terms of imaging, an X-ray is useful to rule out other pathologies like severe OA, a posterior dislocation, a vascular necrosis or a fracture. There are a few other imaging modalities that might show signs of a frozen shoulder, but the guidelines are clear that the diagnosis should be made clinically. When your diagnosis is made, it's time to assess tissue irritability. This is covered by the flowchart as well. The guidelines identify three groups, namely high, moderate, and low irritability. Try to evaluate where your patient fits best to inform your treatment process. It is useful to get an idea of your patient's activity limitations. Ask about their pain levels during sleep, grooming, dressing, and reaching activities. Make sure to lock active and passive range of motion as well. In terms of treatment, it's important to inform your patient about the natural history of frozen shoulders and the importance of activity modification to encourage pain-free range of motion. The strongest recommendation is an intra-articular corticosteroid injection with shoulder mobility and stretching exercises to provide short-term pain relief for four to six weeks. Stretching exercises are advised to be matched to the level of irritability. Other forms of exercises like mobility or resistance exercises can be considered as well. However, this will often need to be combined with a steroid injection to get the best results. There are a few other modalities to consider according to the guidelines. These are short wave diathermy, ultrasound or electrical stimulation combined with mobility and stretching exercises. However, these are based on weak evidence and more recent trials question this. Since this guideline, Two placebo-controlled trials were published that disproved the use of ultrasound. Concerning shortwave diathermy, there is some discussion. And electrical simulation, well, the guidelines note that this should be provided in combination with exercises, as does Sire et al. in 2022. Since we're talking about weak evidence, gliniohumeral joint mobilizations can be used to decrease pain and increase range of motion. However, Doing this in the first few weeks or months might be ineffective. This is probably due to the fact that the inflammatory process is highly active in this phase. Now, you want to assess if your patient is actually getting better using one of these three questionnaires to assess pain and function before treatment and in the weeks or months thereafter is highly advised. That's it for this video. I hope you learned something today. If you want to learn more about frozen shoulders, check out our Stiff Shoulder course by Andrew Cuff and Thomas Mitchell. Make sure to give the package discount a look to get the shoulder, elbow, wrist and hand all in one purchase. The links are in the video description. I'm Max for Tutors and I will see you in another video.